Thank you for the message. Good morning, Gold Creek Church. How y'all doing? It is so good to be here with you guys again. Uh, thank you to Pastor Nick and the leadership team at this church for uh, yeah, having me come and share from God's Word. Um, I've been hearing just awesome stuff that God's doing here at the church. You guys had an incredible Easter weekend, I heard. And uh, obviously, we're in this brand new series as well, uh, which we're going to dive into um, uh, this morning, but uh, so grateful for how God is using your church, uh, this location, multiple locations, and uh, how people are coming to know Jesus because of your ministry. Can you put your hands together for this church, for the leadership, uh, and for what God is doing here, which is so exciting. I get to serve at a church, as Nick just mentioned, called Village Church in Vancouver. We've got sites across Canada, and uh, just excited that uh, we get to be uh, partnering with you guys, being in ministry together, friendship, relationship, connection. Uh, so thrilled for that. So we're in a series called Almost Happy. And uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at uh, things that we uh, typically, as, as people who are looking for fulfillment, looking for meaning, looking for purpose, would try to go to to find those things. So week one, we talked about success, trying to find success and hoping that that will make us happy, that will give us joy, uh, but it doesn't quite do that. And last week, we talked about relationships and marriage and hoping that relationships of some sort would help us uh, find fulfillment and meaning uh, in life. Uh, today we're going to talk about religion and spirituality. How so often uh, we try to find ways to find transcendence, to find something that's beyond this material world, to see if we can find fulfillment and happiness uh, through that. And so we're going to be in Acts chapter 17, uh, starting in verse 22. Acts 17, verse 22. And if you're watching online, uh, live or on demand, just want to say thank you so much for being part of our service uh, this morning. Acts 17 and 22. And before before I read uh, uh, from the text, I want to share a quick story. So a few months ago, I was uh, uh, still in Toronto. So we're in the process, by the way, of our family moving from Toronto to Vancouver um, over these last few months. But this is like last year, I was in Toronto, heading out to a conference in Chicago. It was an early morning flight, 4.30 a.m. The, at the airport, 6 a.m. flight, uh, got to O'Hare and uh, got in an Uber uh, and headed to the, uh, to the conference venue. And when I got there, uh, obviously I was, and I had to check in. So I'd registered already, had to check in and and the way it works is, you know, it's based on your last name, the first letter of your last name. So it's like A to E, uh, F to J, K to O, etc. And, you know, my name is Fanu Ipe. Now, uh, the good thing about my name is, if you Google my name, I'm basically the only person on earth with that name. So from a branding perspective, it's really good. But the challenge is that people can barely pronounce my name, most people can't spell the name right, all of that. So when I go to Starbucks, I'm not Fanu, I'm Finn. Finn seems to be so much easier for them to pronounce. So I'm um, Finn. Then when I, uh, when I fill out an online form, the challenge with my last name is it's a capital, uh, no, uppercase I, of course, and I-Y-P-E. So when I put an uppercase I in and fill out the form, if you're like trying to transcribe it, let's say onto a name tag or whatever at a conference, most people, for some reason, confuse the uppercase I for a lowercase L. So I'm standing in this line, I get up to the front, I say to the lady, my name is Fanu, I've registered, she's looking, 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 she's like, no you haven't. I said, yes I have. No you haven't, I, I can't find your name here, sir. And then you know, a couple of minutes in, it clicks, I'm like, okay, wait. I said, can you talk to the lady at L and ask her if she can find a LIPE? And so she goes over and talks to the lady and she's like, hey, can you find a, a LIPE? And so like, LIPE, 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 yes, we found a LIPE, Fanu LIPE, you're here. Like, that's not my name, but that's okay. So they changed the L to an I, right? And it was all good. But here's my point. She was looking for the right thing, but she was looking for it in the wrong place. So what we're talking about today is not, the, not the, that we shouldn't pursue, that we shouldn't be hungry, we shouldn't look for fulfillment, we shouldn't look for meaning, we shouldn't look for purpose. Of course we should. But the question is, where are we looking? Where do we go to find that in the world around us? And so uh, verse 22 of chapter 17 of the book of Acts says this, So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. So watch this. Paul is standing in Athens. He's in the city of Athens. Athens, right? And he's obviously a Jewish man. So why is a Jewish man standing in the city of Athens? Well, in the Areopagus, you would, uh, it would be the place where you would present ideas, you would debate ideas, re debate philosophies and religions, and, and you go back and forth. The, in 
intellectuals would gather. And part of what Paul is doing, he is so convinced about the message of Jesus, guys, that he's like, I'm not just going to stay in my comfort zone, in my city, in my town where I grew up. I'm going to go out. I'm going to be on the offensive. This is what the Christian faith is about. It's not a defensive faith. It's a faith that is on the offensive. It's an offensive of love, an offensive of truth, an offensive of grace, an offensive of reason and logic and communicating why the scriptures actually make sense and why you can, you can only find human flourishing following Jesus. And so he's standing there and he's talking to them about Jesus. And he says to them, I see that you're really very religious. The, the first myth, I'm going to talk about five myths today. The first myth is Christianity is about religious duties. The truth is Christianity is about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I get it. I get why some people may conclude that. You may conclude that if you grew up maybe in some kind of legalistic church setting. You may conclude that if you're not a Christian, but you grew up around people who were super legalistic and you saw the way they lived their lives. They were one way at church or around church people or around their families, but a completely different person at school or work or wherever else they were hanging out. And so you're like, this is so hypocritical. I don't understand it, right? And I grew up in this. I grew up in a very legalistic Christian home, right? Where it was always about outward appearances, not about internal transformation. In fact, I was talking to a, a guy at our church who grew up in a very legalistic uh, Christian environment and he said, he, he was laughing about it. He's like, you know, one of the things that, was, that we would do is like uh, on Sundays, we were told, this was, the, this was the rule in the church, so on Sundays, you're not allowed to go to the movies. You cannot go to the movies on Sundays. So that was the rule. But then he says, when we did go to the movies during the week, our parents would ask us to lie about our age so we could get the under 12 discount. <laughs> He's like, what are we talking about right now? So on one hand, God wants you to be holy on Sundays and not go to the movies, but during the week, you're allowed to break one of the Ten Commandments to get a quarter off the ticket. Right? And so you grow up around that. You're like, this isn't real. This is fake. You guys are making this stuff up. It makes sense. But the reality is this. It's not based on your outward appearance. God loves you just the way you are. In um, Luke chapter 15 and 20, uh, it's the story of the lost son. And basically the story is the son uh, of a father who asks for his inheritance, takes his inheritance, goes out and, and squanders it, destroys it, lost everything. He eventually lives in a pig pen, uh, serving, the, uh, serving the pigs, eating the scraps off of the pigs. Eventually he comes home. And when he comes home, the Bible says that, that the father sees the son from a far way off. And anyway, I want you to think about this for a moment. He, he's, imagine what he looks like. Looks terrible, I'm sure. Imagine what he smells like. Smells terrible, I'm sure. He's been living with the pigs. And, but the Bible says the father runs to him and embraces him just the way he is. Now, eventually he gets a robe, he gets sandals, he gets a ring, all of that. But the initial connection between the father and son was an embrace regardless of how he looked and what he smelled like and what his past was and what he had done. That's the heart of your heavenly father. If you're wondering, do I have to be perfect before I can come to God? Do I have to figure out my life before I can come to Jesus? The answer is no. The answer is God loves you just where you are. And yes, he'll transform you, but it's not you that can transform yourself. It's his love that can transform your life. I was, talking to a, I was talking to a mom and a daughter in our church a few weeks ago, and uh, the daughter has been coming to our church for, I don't know, a few months now, and the mother is coming, uh, has been coming for a few weeks. And she was telling me her story and the stuff that's happened in her life. She's gone through a lot of brokenness and a lot of tra tragedy in her life and trauma in her life. She's made some mistakes, okay? And so she started coming back to church recently, and she was literally, as she's explaining this to me, she's crying, little tears rolling down her cheeks, and she says, Fanu, I literally thought to myself, I, can, I, don't, I don't deserve to go to church. I don't deserve to be in a church. I don't deserve to be around Christians. I don't don't deserve to be in a place where God's word is being taught because of all the stuff in my life, all the mistakes I've made. And I looked at her and she's crying. And I looked at her and I said, I said, no, that's not true. I said, that's a lie. I said, listen, I want you to know this. The reason we gather together as Christians, the reason we show up here at six in the morning, we set everything up. The worship team rehearses and practices. The preacher prepares the sermon. The ushers at the door, the greeters at the door, the ushers in the lobby, the kids ministry, the coffee that we serve you. Why do we do all of this? Why do we gather? We don't gather so that Christians can have an exclusive club. That's not the point. We gather at Gold Creek so that people in our communities, people in our culture who cannot find a safe place where they can come and be who they are and belong before they believe so they can find transformation, can find a safe place here at this church so they can encounter Jesus, they can hear the scripture taught and their lives can be transformed. Come on. That's why we come. That's why we do this. Why We create a place for people. There's so many people in our culture that are looking for a place of belonging. 
so they can understand what they ought to believe. The church is a hospital for sinners. It's not a museum for saints. See, people, people tell me all the time, does it not matter who I am and what I've done and who's rejected me and who's given up on me and all of that? I said, no. See, the truth is this. The truth is that the gospel says that you are known. You are loved. You are accepted. You have new life. You can find eternal, infinite grace. You can have purpose in Christ. You can have an inheritance of joy and peace and hope in Jesus that nothing and no one in this world can rob from your life. That's the truth. I love what uh, Keller says about this when he talks about Christians and their relationship and their, and their perspectives on people that are yet to become followers of Jesus. Listen to this. Think of people you consider fanatical. They're overbearing, self-righteous, opinionated, insensitive, and harsh. Why? It's not because they're too Christian. It's because they're not Christian enough. They are fanatically zealous and courageous, but they are not fanatically humble, sensitive, loving, empathetic, forgiving, or understanding as Christ was. What strikes us as overly fanatical is actually a failure to be fully committed to Christ and his gospel. So you want to find a mature Christian? It's not the Christian that's so fanatical that they judge everyone and they basically say, you can't come to Christ until you follow all these rules. No, no, no. The, the person that's mature in Jesus is the person that says, man, I want to love on you. I want to show you the grace of God. I want to invite you to my home, my family, my church so that you can experience the same transformative power of Jesus that took a sinner like me and changed my life. In, in other words, a Christian who's mature says, if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. If he can do it for me, he can do it for you. I'm no better than you. You know, sometimes it's, it's, it's easier for the kids, you know, our kids to sometimes get this, right? The message of Jesus uh, versus adults because we have all these, these thoughts and culture puts all these lies in our head. And, and the other day, I'll give you an example. The other day, I was, uh, my wife was uh, talking to my, our daughters. This is a few months ago. And, you know, our kids obviously go to kids' church when we go to church and they read their Bibles and they pray every day and all of that, which is all good. But sometimes in parenting, it can buy, backfire a little bit, okay? Let me explain. So, um, so Lauren and Catherine are having a little bit of an argument and Lauren's not being nice to her little sister. Lauren's fine. Catherine is three. She's just being impatient with her and abrupt and, you know, sort of not, not nice, nice to her. So Trisha steps in, my wife, and says, Lauren, that's not how you talk to your little sister. You've got to be kind. You've got to be patient. She's only three. She doesn't fully understand, you know, what you're saying and stuff. So you've got to be uh, patient with her. And so she explains all of this. And Christian parents do this all the time. Right? We, we bring God into the equation just for extra effect, right? Just to make sure that kids really get it, you know? So Trisha goes like, hey, and just so you know, Lauren, Jesus is watching you. He he watches how you're treating your little sister, right? All of this. So Lauren listens to all of that. And then she goes to Trisha. She says, okay, mama, okay, mommy, I understand. And then she says, and mommy, I want you to know, Jesus already forgave me. <laughs> like too much gospel, too much, too much grace. I want a bit of law, you know? <laughs> But she gets it. She's like, I get it. Like, Jesus loves me. And when I confess and I know I'm wrong, he forgives me. Verse 23. For as I pass along and observe the objects of your worship, Paul continues, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown. This I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. The second myth is this. Worship of self is fulfilling. The worship of self is fulfilling. The truth is, worship of Jesus is transformative. See, this idea that, that I can be at the center of my life. We do this in our culture constantly. The whole new age philosophy is that. It's like, you don't need a God, you just need you. Just worship yourself, right? All you need to do is twist your legs into a pretzel, take a deep breath, and say, I am divine. And say that 10 times, and that's, that's the answer. You can find God within you. But the reality is, it doesn't work. See, that's a very anthropocentric worldview. Like the, the, the Greeks used to say this, the, the ancient Greek philosopher uh, Protagoras would say this, man is the measure of all things, right? Basically, man is the center of all things. All you need is yourself. The truth is that, that doesn't, it doesn't work. I love what um, uh, French philosopher Walt, Voltaire said. He said, in the beginning, God created man in his own image and man has been trying to repay the favor ever since. Right? We're trying to form God in our image now. 
And it's, and it's, it's built into us, guys. So I'm, I'm on the phone yesterday, so my family still is in Toronto, right? So I'm on the phone with them. They're in the car. Trish is driving. The girls are at the back, and they're having some little squabble going on. And I'm listening. I'm just listening to the conversation. So basically what's happening is the three-year-old has taken the five-year-old's camera. We had a little toy camera for her. And the five-year-old, being nice, you know, big sister, loaned it to her. She's playing. The, three, the five-year-old wants it back. Lauren wants it back. So Catherine says to Lauren, when she asks for the camera back, she says, if you want it back, you have to pay for it. Like what? So Trisha goes, you know, I can hear her. Trisha goes, Catherine, why does she have to pay for her camera? And, and, and Catherine goes, because I'm the boss. <laughs> Trisha says, you're the boss? She says, yeah, I'm the boss, baby. <laughs> Be really careful. Pastor Nick talked about minions. Be very careful what your kids watch. All That's all I can say. Okay, so we're having all these issues now because now she thinks she's the boss, baby. Just imagine the poster of that movie, right? That's what my little, my little three-year-old thinks. Now, Watch this, I thought about it after the fact. She's sitting in a car that I bought. My wife and I bought. She's sitting in a car seat that we paid for. She's wearing clothes that we went to the store and got for her. She's holding a camera that we bought from Amazon. (laughs) Nothing she has is hers. It's all a gift. But she thinks she's the boss of all of us. (laughs) Right? And sometimes that's what we do as human beings. That we have no control. All it takes is one call from the doctor's office. All it takes is something happening on a roadway when you're, when you're driving. All it, it just takes minutes, seconds. We have no control over the universe, over anything around us. And yet we think we're gods. All I need is me. Jonathan Hyde, who's a psychologist, has been compiling data about mental health in our culture. And um, here's a couple of the stats. Um, that, uh, that he's pulled together. 52%, there's been a 52% increase in major depressive episodes, MPEs, in adolescents. 63% increase in young adults in, uh, in, in approximately the last 10 years ending in 2019. And of course, it's gone up since then. 15 to 24 year old suicide rose 45% between 2009 and 2019. So in a culture that constantly says, we don't need God, we're good enough. We're, we have technology, we have money, we have all of this stuff. We don't need God. It's like depression is on the rise. Mental health issues are on the rise. We're not fixing ourselves. We're becoming more and more broken. Why? Because there is someone that we need to worship that actually will help transform our lives. I, I got a DM on Instagram the other day from, uh, from someone who comes to our church, a young man who comes to our church, and he says, Pastor Vinu, I want to be baptized. And so I set up a phone call with him and, and got on the phone and said, tell me your story, bro. And he says to me, he says, well, I, I used to worship other gods. I used to be in a different religion and I used to worship idols. And then someone invited me to church two years ago. I'd never been to church before. Someone invited me to church and he says, I came to church for about a year before I made a commitment to Christ, which, which by the way, I want to just highlight, that is so beautiful. I, I, am, I, I love it when people say, I felt comfortable enough to come to a church for months or maybe, maybe a year, in this case, about 12 months, 12 to 15 months, before I made a commitment to Christ. Why? Because it means that the church is a community of people that embraces those who are outsiders as they figure out what it means to become a follower of Jesus. This is why, listen, if you're watching online and you check out our services online here at Gold Creek, I want to invite you to come to our services. Why? Because there's a community of people that that will embrace you, a community of people where you can belong. He said to me, when I was going to the temple and I'd ask questions, they'd be upset at me. They'd say, how dare you question us? But he says, when I came to Village, our church there in Vancouver, he says, people would answer my questions. They would make me feel like I'm part of the community so I could understand what it meant to follow Jesus. And then he says, I gave my life to Christ. It's about 18 months ago now. And he says, my life has been tra- transformed. He says, Fanu, my, my marriage has been transformed. My business, he owns multiple businesses. My business has been transformed. He says, everything about me has changed. And he says to me, I don't understand it. I don't know why it's happening, but it's happening. And I said to him, bro, this is what happens. You can worship idols. You can make your own gods and nothing changes. You can do religious practices and exercises, but nothing happens. But when you come to Jesus, every time you come to him and worship him and read his word and give yourself to him, he begins to transform your world. He begins to transform your heart. And now him and his wife want to get baptized. How amazing is that? No Christian history. Born and raised in Vancouver. Now he's going to follow Jesus. And, he's, and by the way, he's telling, he's telling everyone about, about Christ because he's so pumped. Verse 26. 
And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Paul is standing in Athens and says, guys, I'm of a different race than you guys. I'm of a different religion than you guys. I'm of a different experience, philosophy and worldview than you guys. We're so culturally we're different. Our food is different. Our, our, our clothing may be different. All our cultural practices may be different, right? But he's like, guess what? You can worship the same God because it's the same God who created you. See, this idea, the, the myth is this. Only certain people from certain places with certain experiences can come to Christ. That's, that's a myth. That's, that's not true. The truth is this. Everyone is welcome to experience Jesus. You know, when I first came to Canada, I was 18 years old. I grew up in a Middle Eastern country called Bahrain. I was born and raised there. Uh, it's in the Arabian Gulf. But my parents originally are from South India, okay? So when I came to Canada to go to Bible college, and I was telling people about this, uh, once I got to Toronto, people would be, I'd have multiple people ask me this question. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. So you're a Bahraini from, of Indian descent, and you're a Christian pastor? I said, yes. So how does that happen? How does that work? Like, what do you mean? Because in their mind, if you're from the Middle East, you've got to be a certain religion. If you're from India, you've got to be a certain religion. In, in other words, it's like, hey, it, you, who you follow depends on where you come from. And I get it. Listen, I understand. Some people, they don't get the choice. They don't get the option. If you're born into a certain religious background in some cultures, that's what you do for the rest of your life. No one even gives you the option to explore and understand who, the, the, the truth of who God is. But the reality is this. Everyone is welcome. Everyone is welcome to experience Christ. Everyone is welcome. The, the vision of the, of the New Testament church is a transnational kingdom where, where everyone can gather together and worship Jesus together. This was amazing in the Roman Empire. I want you to think about this for a moment. The Christian faith was the most exclusive in the Roman Empire, right? Because they were willing to worship, the, the Romans were willing to worship, the Greeks were willing to worship multiple gods. But the Christian said, if you want to follow, if you want to know God, you've got to follow Jesus. He's the only way. But then... They were exclusive in worship of Jesus, but they were the most inclusive community. Because the Greeks and the Romans, they didn't mix the rich and the poor. The, the Jews, they didn't mix different ethnicities. But in the church, the rich and the poor could worship together. Those in the higher classes of society and those in the lower classes of society could worship together. Those who were Gentiles, non-Jewish people, and Jewish people could worship together. This was revolutionary thinking. This, you had this place, one place in that community, in that society, where everyone could come and everyone was equal before God and everyone could have the same grace that Jesus gives to all of humanity. And so when we look at our culture, when we look at our world, when we look at people that are different from us, the perspective we ought to have is, Jesus died for that person too. For God so loved the world that he gave his son, that whoever, it doesn't matter what the color of your skin is, it doesn't matter what your religious background is, it doesn't matter where you work, where you live, what zip code you live in. It doesn't, that's not the point. If you're a human being created in the image of God, then Jesus died for you and he wants to transform your life. Verse 29, Paul keeps going. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Here's the myth. Worship of, material, of the material world is eternal and powerful. The worship of the material world is eternal and powerful. That somehow you can worship things, objects, material things, and they will have eternal value. They will somehow give you power to change your life, to transform your life. The truth is this. The worship of Jesus provides eternal hope and real power. See, I talked about religious idols. But mostly in our culture, in Western culture, it's not religious idols that's the challenge. It's the idols we create of things. John Stott says this, theologian, he says this, idols are not limited to primitive societies. There are many sophisticated idols. An idol is a God substitute. Any person or thing that occupies the place which God should occupy is an idol. Listen, fame, wealth, power, sex, food, alcohol, and other drugs, parents, spouse, children, friends, work, and recreation. All of those things can be idols. We can, be, we can create idols of the things we want, the things we think will give us a better life. Listen, I've only been a West Coaster since like January or so, and I'm telling you, man, by April, I'm very tempted to worship the sun god. 
Don't send Nick emails, that was a joke, just in case, okay? <laughs> right, because when you're, when, I, I'm not used to this, right? In Toronto, the sun's out all the time, but, but here it's like, man, it's like cloudy and gray and rainy for so many months, and finally when the sun comes, you're like, oh, what can I do to get you to come out more often? How can I worship you, <laughs> right? Like it's, it's so tempting to try to do things that make us feel better. We were just like house hunting for the last few months in Vancouver, right? And the real estate agents tell you every time you look at a house, they're like, you know, you got to you gotta imagine yourself living in the house. You got to imagine yourself living in the community. So you start imagining and imagining and imagining. Eventually, you fall in love with the idea of the house, right? You, you fall in love with, oh man, if I could have a deep soaker tub, Ooh, if I could, if I could have a, a nice balcony from my bedroom off of one house we looked at, guys, it was, we, didn't, we, didn't, we couldn't buy it. It was too, it was too expensive. But the, 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 second, the second floor bedroom, it's like you look out in this mountains. Ooh, imagine me sitting with my wife and having a cup of tea in the evening looking at the mountains. Some of them had like little breakfast nooks. Oh, imagine sitting by the breakfast nook in the morning with a cup of coffee doing your devo. You begin imagining it and all of a sudden you fall in love with the idea of the house. In other words, you begin to look at a house not only as shelter. Oh no, it's not just safety. Is there a door you can clock? No, no, it's more than that now. It's not just storage. Do you have enough space for all your stuff? No, no, no. Now it's this will make me feel better. If I can live in that community, if I can have this kind of house, then my life will be better. The truth is that's not, that's not real, it's, it's a lie, right? Because we do this with, with jobs, if I can get that job, if I can buy that car, that dream car, if I can buy that dream house, if I can go on vacation to this spot every single year, right? I don't even know vacation spots in, in the West Coast now, everyone tells me Cabo, so I gotta research this, okay? But, you know, maybe that's, that's it, if I could go to Cabo every year, right? Like, whatever it is, it's like if I could do, some of us is shopping, if I could buy all this stuff, if I could buy those clothes, right? Some of us, it's not the clothes, if I could get the body to get into the clothes that I want to get into, right, right? Some of you, it's going to take a minute to get that. Okay, you know, so you're, 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 doing, you're saying all of these things, like if I can have these things, then I will feel better about my life. And the truth is you won't. It's like when I finally called for home insurance for the, for the house, the home insurance quote was so expensive. It was like three, four times more expensive than Toronto. I was like, why in the world? Eventually the lady tells me, oh, sir, that's because earthquake insurance is included. I said, what? Earthquake, I said, she said, no one told you? Guys, no one told me for the last four months that we on the West Coast are expecting the next big one. It's coming. As far as the insurance company, that's what they told me. I'm like, what are you talking about? Right? And we were negotiating and finally I said, way too expensive. I said, you know what? Keep your earthquake insurance. I'm just going to pray to Jesus. So I'm on the prayer team of the no earthquake on the West Coast for the next, day, next 100 years, okay? So maybe some of you want to join the Facebook group or something. I'm going to start. Anyways, here's my point. California, guys. I can't afford it. Here's my, so, so you look at it. You're like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So, so you're telling me the earth's going to shake around my dream house and there's going to be cracks that are going to fo- form? And, and the thing that I thought would make my life better? Yes. Yes, what if there's a crack that forms in your health, in your beautiful body? What if a crack forms in the perfect job? What if there's a crack in the perfect relationship that you thought if I could marry this person, if I could be friends with those, those people from that part of town, then my life would be so much more meaningful. What happens when cracks form in the idols of your life? Here's what, the, here's what the scripture says. The scripture says when the world around you shakes, when the ground under you shakes, there is one on whom you can build your life. He is the rock of your salvation. He is the one who will hold you in the midst of trouble, in the midst of trial, in the midst of sickness. When everything is, is shaking around you, there is one that you can rely on. And the Bible says no one can snatch you from his hands. His name is Jesus and you got to build your life on him. That's the hope. That's what we preach. We don't preach prosperity. We don't preach get all the stuff in the world and you'll be happy. No, we preach find Jesus. When you have him as the anchor of your life, you can have stuff, you can lose stuff. He holds you. Finally, verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. There's a parable of postmodernism where a king is looking at an elephant, okay? And six blind people come around this elephant. Each of them holds a different part of the elephant. One guy holds the trunk, feels that it's long and round, and says, an elephant is like a snake. 
Another guy holds the tusk and it's sharp and says an elephant is like a spear. Another guy holds the, the legs and feels that it's, it's strong and tall and says an elephant is like a tree, so on and so forth. And the king ultimately says, well, see, all of the, the blind men are true in some sense, but none of them have exclusive truth about the elephant. So Leslie Newbegin, who was a missionary, had this parable thrown at him constantly when he talked about Jesus being the only way. And one of the things he commented about this story, about this parable, was this. He says, so the king's point is, no one has exclusive truth because everyone only has a part of the elephant. And yet, the reason the king is able to say that is because he has the ultimate exclusive perspective. In other words, the one who says you cannot, you are not allowed to have exclusive views on God, is himself having an exclusive view of God, hence he can critique those others who have exclusive views of God. It doesn't work. Here's the reality. Every religion, see the myth is all religions lead to God. The, the truth is, Jesus is the only way to God. And here's why that is, it's very simple. Because every other religious philosophy in the world says you have to do something to get to God. If you're a Christian and you're sharing your faith with people, here's a very easy way to communicate this. Every other religion of the world says you must be involved in your own salvation. Islam says there's five pillars. I grew up in Bahrain where the call to prayer went out five times a day, my, all of my life, 18 years of my life. In India, where my parents come from, in Hinduism, it's the karmic belief, rebirths, samsara, the cycle of samsara, so I can get moksha, I can have eternal life. But in order to get eternal life, I have to come, I have to be reborn many, 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 many times and pay for all my debts. In Buddhism, it's the eight noble paths. In Sikhism, it's the five Ks and the worship of the Guru Granth Sahib, which is their holy book. You have to do all of these things in order to get saved. See, I, I heard about a man who comes from a karmic view, religion, um, and he came to faith in Christ. And so the person that led him to faith in Christ said, what was it ultimately that convinced you? He said, well, he said, I'm a businessman and I am used to taking loans from the bank. He says, when I take a loan from the bank, I know how much I've borrowed and I know how long it will take for me to pay it back. He says, the problem with the karmic view is no one can tell me how much of my sins I need to repay or pay for. And no one can tell me how many rebirths I need to go through in order to pay my debt in full. He says, what helps me when I come to Jesus is it's not my work. It's his finished work on the cross. Jesus died perfect and sinless. He died not for himself, but for me to take my sins away. Athanasius says this, he became what we are so that he might make us what he is. Think about that. He became what we are so that he might make us what he is. That's the gospel. God became like us, human, without sin, died on a cross, rose from the grave and said, everyone who believes in me can now have what I have, a perfect relationship with the Father. I love reading the gospels about, you know, the story and the life of Jesus, but I love reading Revelation when it talks about Jesus appearing as the risen Savior. Listen to Revelation chapter 1, 17 and 18. This is Jesus speaking. He said, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades, the keys of death and hell. See, the, the way to joy, the way to happiness in Christ, it's not circumstantial happiness. It's not situational happiness. There is a joy, an eternal, enduring, everlasting joy that in the end of the day, God will have the final say. Listen to me. Online, I want you to listen to me. Death will not have the final say. Divorce will not have the final say. Depression will not have the final say. Darkness will not have the final say. Jesus has the final say. Because as we sang earlier, there is no body in the grave. There is only one who wears the crown and his name is Jesus. And because he died for you, because he loves you, because he makes a way for you to have eternal life, 
I want you to know this today. God is for you, not against you. God is for you, not against you. God is for you. He is not against you. If you are in this room or watching online and you're saying, Fanu, I, I've tried every other way, but I'd like to try Jesus. I'd like to invite him into my life and like to give him an opportunity to be the Lord of my life, to transform my life. If that's you, just pray with me right now as we pray together. Lord Jesus, I come to you. I come to you on behalf of my friends in this room and those online that say they want to give you a chance. So Lord, as they pray this prayer, would you come and encounter them? Would you transform them? Pray the simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you're God's son. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave. I believe you paid the price for my sin. I choose to follow you. Please come, transform my life. Make me new. Help me. Help me know what it means to be a follower of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So good to have Pastor Fanu here with us today. So glad that he is uh, just a short drive from Vancouver now, and um, just great to have that friendship and that partnership with him. You know, as he was saying, it's that personal relationship that Jesus so desires with us, just as deeply inside of all of us, we so desire to have that personal relationship with someone who you can lean on, who you can trust, who you can guide you. So often we're looking in the wrong places. Yet he, Jesus is right there in front of us. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna close out the service with one last song. So I invite you to stand up as we do this. And as you do this, as we do this song here, I just wanna invite you, if you're, whether you're online or you're here in the room, we have prayer team members at the prayers, at the cross, so we'd love to pray with you and just to, to process through, through this day with you. Let's worship. Oh
your battles. Jehovah Nisi fight your battles. Jehovah Nisi fight your battles. Jehovah Nisi fight your battles. Jehovah Jireh meets your need. Jehovah Rapha heal your body. Jehovah Shalom be your peace. Jehovah Nisi, fight your battles. Jehovah Jara meets your need. Jehovah Rapha, heal your body. Jehovah Shalom, be your peace. Jehovah Nisi, fight your battles. Jehovah Jara meets your need.